Welcome everybody to Learn with Lowell. Today we're joined with Nir Brazili, Director of the Einstein Institute of Aging Research at Albert Einstein College of Medicine, among many other titles and accolades. Dr. Brazili is one of the key leaders in the longevity space, so I want to uh, join everyone in thanking you for coming on to the, uh, the show today. Sure, and and nice nice speaking to you know a young person like you will probably enjoy the benefits of what you're doing for longer than us. Yeah, it's, it, it feels like a good time to be alive. You know, it's like you have so much new technology coming in and all the problems with uh, AI, with biotechnology, all these medical problems that are coming up. Um, we actually have tools that we can do something about it versus if it was like 100 years ago uh, where we used to like leech people and stuff. You know, like we actually have like meaningful scientific instruments and technology we can use. Uh, absolutely. There, there are more promises now than challenges, but of course... There's always challenges, even now when we when we uh, do M uh, AI, it's 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 hard to get this team together. You know, the computer people are not going to give us answers if we're not asking them the question or if we you, they don't understand what it is, because otherwise they give us usually the answers that we already know. So. Uh, AI is very important. It's staying here and it accelerates everything we're doing. Mm -hmm. Are you using or utilizing any AI machine learning and what you're developing right now? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. You know, uh, we are uh, we are one of the projects that really is on my mind a lot is to find biomarkers for aging. Mm -hmm. um, you know, cholesterol is a great biomarker that the cardiologist has because it's not only a biomarker for predicting you have a heart you'll have a heart attack it's also the cause so when you take it and you treat it and you measure it you decrease the risk i wish we had it with the aging but aging mm -hmm. is much more complicated there are many more biomarkers to consider to consider and what we have because we have technology that gives us what we call omics we get a lot we get 100,000 things on each individual, okay, that, that we can know about them. But then we need to take the computation and then the machine learning to actually uh, create what we call clocks, clocks that will take those biomarkers together and tell us, okay, we know your chronological age is in your driver license, in your passport. And now we're telling you you're three years younger or older than your age, or even more important, okay, you're older than your age, but you know what? You can do something about it. You can exercise and diet and sleep and be socially connective. It's all affecting the biology and we'll measure how it's going to affect your aging. So mm -hmm. those things are here. Um, they they take a while to get to work as a team and, and understand who is asking what and, and what makes sense in the answers also. But... It's terrific as it it's advanced our research by by a lot. Mm -hmm. So one one concern I have when I hear about these uh, bioaging clocks biomarkers is I fear or I think that we don't have a big enough data lake. We don't have we haven't been um, cataloging. Uh, you know, I always wonder, I, I say this a lot for long time listeners, but you know, for new people, I always feel like when we donate blood or plasma, we should have a little box that you can check and then it makes it like this central repo that people can do um, research like this on it as well. So we can have a, a, a wider net to start inferencing and determining stuff off of. I feel like when I read a lot of these studies or I, I think about it, I feel like we don't have as deep of a, a database or a deep of a biomarker pool to start uh, figuring out what is good and and or bad or you know like separating the wheat from the chaff is another way of saying it i i you know there's a lot of studies mm -hmm. been happening for ages and there are even biotechs like bioage is an example of a biotech that uh you know got associated with a study that went for decades and they got plasma and blood from those subjects and they could measure a lot, a lot of biomarkers and see how they're related to death or diseases. So we have a lot of those. Mm -hmm. What I'm trying to do is to get a head start and take studies that have been done with what we call gerotherapeutics. Gerotherapeutics is drugs that target the biology of aging. So we... Um, so we take studies that were done and we're going to the investigators and take 
their blood from, you know, before and within a year of the study to see what has changed, because that way it's not only about the biomarkers for aging, but what have changed with therapy. That's very mm -hmm. important. And they might not be the same. In fact, I know they're not the same. So uh, we'll, we'll have to get, uh, to get those studies. It always takes longer than I hope. I'm actually doing this study that we called it fast because we thought we can do it fast, but it's already a year and we didn't do that much because it takes time to identify and to transfer. But I, I, think, I think there are studies, there are ways to look at it. There are lots of biomarkers. We have to harmonize them. We have to measure all of them at the same individual, right? Because it's not going to be one. It's going to be mm -hmm. the proton and metabolome and and uh, and uh, and the genome and the you know there's there's a lot of things we'll have to measure and come with the best five or ten or fifty or five hundred that will give us what we need to uh, study. Mm -hmm. So if the if it's not the the biomarkers, it's not the the database side of it. What are the limiting factors in aging research outside of funding? I mean, I imagine if you could just get you know a blank check, we could go much faster as well. But what are the limiting factors in terms of is there is there anything missing for us to do the research to the level that you'd like to do it at? Well, you know uh, the way the way I look at aging research, uh, we are doing three things in parallel: the investigations, our, our, us, the geroscientists. We are trying to create uh, the Dorian Gray uh, effect. Dorian Gray didn't get old, right? Mm -hmm. uh, his aging was stunned when he looked at the mirror, he saw himself uh, age, right? And he knew that he's aging, but he didn't feel that. And we have a uh, gerotherapeutics that seems to uh, increase health span uh, delay aging, you know, and, and delay mortality. In other words, have longevity as their side effects. And there are at least 12 drugs that are FDA approved, which, me, which mean you have to repurpose them. It's not you, any, any doctor can prescribe it now, but you need to repurpose it if you want to do a study that says, yeah, that it's doing that. Um, Another scenario that we work at is what's called the fountain of youth. Um, take an old person and make it young again, okay? Mm -hmm. This is really difficult. And, and I, I wonder if we could ever do it. I don't think we'll need to do it eventually. But one thing we can do definitely is make an older body young or younger, not young, but younger. For example, uh, we're accumulating what's called senescent cells or zombie cells. And when we kill them in animals, they improve health span, but also we're trying them in humans. It's more complex because the targets are not well developed, but we get some results and eventually we'll be able to target those senescent cells and improve uh, health and improve disease. Uh, and lastly, is more like the Peter Pan scenario where uh, in 50 years, okay, and, and it's not going to apply to you anymore, but when you're 20 years old, you'll go and get the treatment that will kind of erase your aging and you'll repeat the treatment every few months or few years. And then you could, you'll be able to live younger for a longer period of time. And on each one of those, there are examples of what we can do. And what, what are the challenges? Well, the first challenge is money, <laughs> okay? Mm -hmm. Like yeah. always. The second challenge is to keep this pipeline. You know, we have to have more investigators in the field. We have to have more postdocs in the field. Uh, and we have enough money to do research that is getting more expensive just because we have many tools that are expensive and we're doing many tests that are increasingly expensive now that we measure not one thing, but 100,000 things, right? At, at mm -hmm. one, it's still relatively cheap, but it's expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the other challenge that I, that I told you is the, is the biomarker, uh, the biomarker challenge. 
The third is the FDA challenge. In other words, how do we convince the FDA that aging is a target and that people who are developing drugs to target aging, and aging is what drives diseases, if they target aging, it's a prevention for age-related diseases. This is a major thing that I'm dealing with. Mm -hmm. uh, and another thing that uh, is, I'm passionate, it, it's not everything we need to do, right? It's the things I'm passionate about is, um, you know, we made a great advance by knowing the genetics behind many diseases. In fact, the company, the pharmaceutical that's called Regeneron, that's what they do. They, they go to humans and they take hundred thousands or millions of people and they sequence their genome and they see people with mutation that maybe activates or, or inhibits a pathway and see what disease they have and develop a drug to imitate whatever this genetics is doing. Two thirds of the drugs that were developed uh, last year uh, were approved by the FDA were based on genetic data. The fact that we used to work in mice and think that we know what's relevant to humans didn't work very well for us, but the genetics well works for, well for us. So you're asking, how is it related to aging? Well, I've been interested in people who live for 100 years mm -hmm. and they've been doubling their life expectancy compared to the people you know, in their class, their cohort. And uh, we found that they have those longevity genotypes that, that are gen functional genotypes that slows their aging. And there are few drugs that have been developed uh, in part because of our finding. And we're having a, a huge effort that's called Super Ager Initiative. It's run by the American Federation for Aging Research. Uh, and I'm running it because I'm the scientific director of the, of the federation. But we're recruiting 10,000 families of centenarians to try and find more longevity genes and, and, and think of therapeutics that will increase our lifespan to our maximal capacity as, as a species. So you're, uh, if anyone listening has a family member that lived to over 100 years old, is it just the their direct children or even like grandchildren? Like when would be the cutoff for the people that you're looking for? Oh, the grandchildren will be the best. So mm. it's very simple. You go to American Federation for Aging Research, Super Agers, mm -hmm. and in the Super Agers, you can register and we can help you get your grandparents if if he's the one who's our, or great grandparents who's, who was 106 years old, right? Um, and what we do, we don't take them anywhere. We send them... A, a, a tube, so they spit in a tube and we have their DNA and we can find their genes, but then we recruit also their family members. So we can have a sample that includes their offspring. Their offspring are also healthier and mm -hmm. people who are married to their offspring. So we have kind of, kind of the same uh, background, genetic background. And, uh, and so those triplets we're trying to recruit as many as possible. So if any one of you know, or have a relative or know, know anybody who's centenarian, get in touch with us and we can do some of the work uh, ourselves, but we need information. And then you spy. mentioned, sorry, go ahead. Spy for us. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, I'll, the links will be in the show notes for that. The, so you mentioned um, getting the FDA to see aging as a disease. I believe in the last year to six months, you were at Congress, um, doing a presentation with TAME and talking about aging, did did that result in anything that would make you think that the FDA is going to be a little bit more open to seeing aging as a disease? Or, or I see you're always doing just, when I'm looking at, when I think what could be done to do, like to push things forward, you're always doing the thing, right? You're at Congress trying to educate the people, make the policy. And so I imagine FDA is listening too. So I'm just wondering, since you were there, what was it like? And what, what do you think the results were? And were, are we, what more needs to be done to have the FDA to get on board with seeing it as aging, as a disease? So yes, the, the time scale is a bit different, but we had a meeting uh, with mm. the FDA. But le let, me, let me make a point. It's, it's really an important point. Is aging a disease? If you ask me as a geroscientist, aging is the mother of diseases because aging 
is what drives those diseases. In other words, you can be born with a genotype for Alzheimer's, you know, ApoE4, you can be homozygous for ApoE4, which means that you're likely to get Alzheimer's when you're 60, 70, and you'll be dead when you're 80. So listen what I just said. You're not born demented. You don't get demented where you're one year old or 10 years old or 50 years old. You need decades of aging to get the diseases. It's true for every one of those age-related diseases, name, namely uh, diabetes or cancer or cardiovascular disease. Um, all those are driven by aging. So aging is the mother of those diseases. And if we stop aging, we stop all those diseases, not one of them. And we don't treat the diseases, we prevent them. Uh, so in this sense, aging is a disease. But I find it not helpful to call it a disease. Hmm. And the reason is, first of all, the elderly, the older adults in the United States, which we want to help, we want to make them healthier, we want to prevent their disease, they don't want to be called sick. Look mm -hmm. what happened during COVID. We packed them and put them and isolated in islands and they couldn't see their families and they couldn't see their grandchildren. We did a lot of harm by declaring that they're old, right? There was a lot of ageism in how we treated that. Uh, and so they don't want to be called sick. And you know what? Not everybody over the age of 60 is sick either, okay? So calling them sick is not going to work for them. Also, the FDA doesn't want to call aging a disease and the AARP, the retirement, doesn't want to call aging a disease and the American Federation for Aging Research doesn't want to call aging a disease. And what we found with the FDA, that it doesn't matter what we call it, okay? Mm -hmm. They agree that if we can stop several diseases at once, it's good, okay? So, so what we're doing, we're preventing a cluster of age-related disease. We'll call it aging. They can go, you know, they might say, you know, by accident, you have several drugs that do all those things. It's all by accident. Well, we don't think it's by accident. We understand the mechanism, but who cares, okay? The, the thing is to make progress. I think though that eventually, um, aging will kind of become a disease just like high cholesterol is a medical condition, right? Your age will be a medical condition, but will be able to help you to, to stay healthy and maximize your health at any, any point. So that's really important. Uh, I'm trying to find one, one listener wrote in about uh, COVID in particular, I just want to like follow up, um, but I couldn't find in my notes where it went. So a uh, person I'll find you post and I'll, I'll tag you appropriately, but they wanted to ask about uh, COVID and metformin. And apparently there's like a link there for people who are having lo uh, long COVID and some somehow that metformin will help them with that. I wish I could find your exact words. I just was trying to like control F to find it. But um, what is the, the association between those two things? No, no problem. And, I, and I, I think it's a very telling thing. You know, metformin is a gerotherapeutic, okay? It's a drug that targets all the hallmark of aging because uh, the, uh, the hallmarks of aging are such that if you target one of them, you affect the others too. And metformin is a drug that does it. So it doesn't only affect metabolism, it, it, it affects epigenetics, it affects mitochondria, it affects, okay, it affects a bunch, bunch of things, including the immune function. Okay, which is also a hallmark of aging, or inflammation, also a hallmark of aging. So, what happened during COVID? There were about nine papers around the world that showed that people who had COVID and were on metformin, so they were diabetics, had basically half the mortality and half the hospitalization for COVID. Okay, which is a remarkable effect. Mm -hmm. Imagine if we could prevent half of the mortality. Um, so there, so you know, but this is an association study, right? You could argue, well, maybe with metformin, they were better controlled, they were more, less obese, you know, other things, which wasn't, wasn't right, but you know, it's association studies. So they uh, started doing uh, several, um, 
uh, clinical studies, okay? In clinical study, you take people and half of them get the drug and half of them get placebo. In one study, they compared metformin to two other drugs and only metformin prevented hospitalization and mortality by 40 and 50%, okay? This is a clinical study. In another clinical study, they showed that giving metformin within three days of disease, and by the way, those were all non-diabetic, mm -hmm. uh, then you decrease long COVID by 50%. So everything you said about the question was right. And for me, it's not, it's not the point that metformin was effective against COVID, but it's a point that people who say, no, metformin is for diabetes, they're absolutely wrong. It's mm. not only for diabetes, it's not its major purpose. It affects a lot of things. And that's why people with diabetes has less cancer when they take metformin and less cardiovascular disease and less diabetes and less mortality. All that has been shown. Yeah, there's a, a lady on YouTube called Physics Girl. She talks about physics, obviously, and she has long COVID. And so um, you talked about if you administer, if you take metformin within three days, um, what about when you have it? And she, I think she's on like, she's been, it's been long, long, long COVID. She's been in the hospital and all these other things. When you, when it's been months down the line, can you still take it and have any effect? You know, I didn't, I, I didn't hear any, there's no study like that, that mm. I, but I didn't also hear that, but, but there is another thing and, and maybe it, it'll give another example of why things are so interesting and unpredictable. But there's one thing that is so interested that's related to aging, and that's a treatment in hyperbaric oxygen. Hmm. Have you heard about that? Yeah, I, what? Yeah, you have it on a on a list of questions. <laughs> no, I just I know of it. I I've, I've been uh, yeah. looking at. It. Apparently, it's a really good way to uh, kill a flesh eating diseases. Like it like starves it or something. Like they really right. hate it. Yeah, I don't know. Right. right. So hyperbaric medicine started developing because a disease that divers used to get. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but the use, right, the bends, and it's expanded to other use such as anaerobic, anaerobic uh, bacteria. So those anaerobic bacteria, if you put them in oxygen, they die. So uh, lots of people with wounds and with flesh wounds, and there's, you know, other indications to use that. But uh, uh, there, there is a use for this inten in extensive use, for example, uh, football, there are football clubs. Um, um, the, the, the Steelers, for example, everyone with concussion goes to a therapy in this oxygen chamber. Mm. Uh, People who have mild cognitive impairment, they go there and they feel better. Uh, people who have traumatic stress, and that's a terrible disease. They cannot get their life together and nothing helps. They go to the chamber and it's better. But the latest study, really the latest study, which is one of the best study because it's a control study. In other words, half of the people got the treatment and half of the people got fake treatment, okay? The people who got the, those are all people with long COVID, those that got the treatment, the majority of them were totally, uh, totally healthy after a while, okay? Hmm. So I think if you have somebody with uh, COVID, you should look for the this hyperbaric uh, oxygen. I can give you uh, things. The only thing, it's a big commitment. It's, uh, it's treatment every day for an hour or two for several weeks. So it's hmm. not... Uh, uh, it, it's not, you know, uh, there or affordable for anyone. But for me, when I heard that oxygen is a therapy, I was so mad. I said, are they out of their minds? I mean, all, everything we try to do is to give antioxidants, right? To stop mm -hmm. the toxic effect of oxygen. So what? They're giving more oxygen. But the biology of that is so interesting that in my lab, I purchased in hyperbaric chamber, and um, and I um, I'm I'm doing now uh, experiments and showing actually that is, it has an effect of aging, that mm. is from mechanism that are totally unpredictable by just l l listening to l just hearing that you know. Mm. That's yeah, it's interesting. What it what is it about the hyperbolic chambers that a lot 
allow it to have such an effect? Is it just over oxygenation? Like, is there, do we know like what chemically or whatever's going on on, on like the, the micro level to know what, why that's working so effectively? So, so that's a great question. So there, there are two answers. And I think, you know, it's like, rem remember the hallmarks, you, you, mm -hmm. you one and you, you, you hit the other two. I think in most of those things, you need more than one thing to happen. So mm -hmm. the first answer is there is a decline in our small vessels. Okay. 40% decline with aging of small vessels which means that we have a lot of cells that don't, don't get blood supply. They don't die, but they're not alive either, okay? Because they're just with low oxygen. Now, to give you a mask with 100% oxygen will saturate your oxygen, but it's not going to move out of the vessels. In order to move out of the vessels, you have to put it under pressure. So you mm. double the atmosphere, you do it in two atmospheres. And in two atmospheres, the oxygen leaves the blood cells and goes around in the tissue and diffusing the tissue and basically awakes cells that have been kind of out mm. of it for a long time. Um, that's one thing that happens. The second thing is actually low oxygen has, when you have low oxygen, you have actually the longevity factors, the, the things that are increased biologically with low oxygen are the ones that are protective for aging. So you're saying, well, that's the opposite because you're giving more oxygen. Yes, but when you take the body and give it high oxygen in two atmosphere, and then you return it to low oxygen in one atmosphere, you fool the body and it thinks that now it is no oxygen. So it hmm. increases all those things that are the biological things that are good for longevity. Both of those things probably happen and maybe some other things happen, but it's quite striking that it came out of left field. It sounded awful, but all of a sudden there's another biology and another way to look at it. Yeah. I'm reminded of um, with people like Brian Johnson, who I don't know if you're familiar with, but he's making something called like the blueprint, which is kind of like he's making himself like a case study for all these different interventions. Like, I don't think he's doing hyperbolic chambers. I'll have to like ping him on, on Twitter to see if he's doing it. But it reminds me of the time where when we were studying the brain, we only really knew through something was going wrong. So like if there was like Phidias Gage, we had a real respect through his head. It's like, oh, that region probably has something to do with, you know, temperament and mood because they would start getting, he was very ornery after that fact. And he, uh, everyone around him stopped wanting to be his friend. And so um, I wonder if people like Brian Johnson are like the case studies that are developing themselves as like case studies for like canaries in a coal mine to show um, the application of some of these technologies outside of the R&D uh, um, side of, of just research, which is my question of, is there, I guess the, the, the only question is, is there value in people like Brian Johnson making these blueprint ways of like, oh, I'm going to follow this protocol, or should we really be waiting for the science to be proven out before we start doing these types of like Phidias gauge type experiments on ourselves? <laughs> That's a great question, a great discussion, and you'll see where where I'm going. So I met I met Brian Johnson. I mm. spent time with him. I also at first people wanted me to interview about him, and I didn't. And recently, I did give an interview. and And there are a few things I want to tell you. First of all, look, I'm also frustrated. I'm dealing with this for thirty years, and I'm getting older. Not that I'm not doing things. I'm not, I'm doing things, and I'm doing things effectively, but. But it's very frustrating that we kind of know a lot about aging and we can still not stop it effectively. And so I understand Brian Johnson, and I think it's important to have a voice like Brian Johnson that says that it's a frustration. Um, now, he, he and I are doing several things, and we measured our biological age, what seems to be in the same methodology. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we are both three years younger than our age. I have done, um, basically, I'm doing intermittent fasting. I'm exercising every day and I'm taking metformin. Okay. Those are the three things I'm doing. S social connectivity, I don't need because I'm talking to you. I'm already, <laughs> you know, after parabiosis. Exactly. But, 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 um, Brian Johnson takes, he does a lot of things with exercise, with diets and stuff, but he also takes 105 supplements, mm. okay? 
Um, so he's one body that does a lot of things and take 105 supplements. And he's assuming that every supplement, and, and by the way, if you look at every supplement, okay, he's right. It, it's supposedly good, but you assume that if you take it together, you're going to add them or even synergize them. But in fact, there are things that are tongue antagonizing each other. And I think he's doing so much more and getting the same effect as I am, uh, which tells me, you know, I'm doing things more responsible. Hmm. Do we learn from him? The answer is absolutely not. Okay. Hmm. This is what we call N equals one. Okay. Yeah. It has to do, it has to do, look, uh, it has to do with the price. You know, it's, it's like, several millions a year to sustain what he's doing. So it's not a public consumption, although some of it is just measurement, but everybody needs measurement. It's on the background of his genetics, okay? And, and we know that things cannot apply to everyone. We, the one thing we learn in medicine, we have to personalize the medicine. That's mm -hmm. why also we want a lot of biomarker and stuff because we want to personalize the, the medicine, we cannot personalize medicine with somebody who's doing experiment. And in my mind, if those $20 million went to do a study, he would have much more impact, but nobody's going to say, hey, do the Brian Johnson. No, I mean, no, no physician is going to say. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, physicians, you know, you know what they teach us in first year, uh, first day of medical school? Mm -hmm. No. Do no, do no harm. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. Um, so basically, half of us, you know, let's just do nothing. You know, <laughs> at least we're not doing harm, right? We mm -hmm. become very conservative. And the second day on medicine, you you learn that there's no never and no no always in medicine. Okay. So you can have a drug that saves hundred people, but it kills three. You know, and you don't know how. So what are you going to do with it, right? So you're conservative and unsure, okay? So we are that kind of people. And I think we are, and I'm I'm trying to get out of this set a little bit, but I understand it because that's how I was trained, right? And I'm a professor of medicine and genetics. I have the genetics part, but I'm a professor of medicine, right? So I kind of understand where it's going. And, and I understand the value of doing clinical studies to show that there is effect and that the effect is on the population and that it's safe, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, on the other hand, on the other hand, a lot of people are trying a medicine under supervision. supervision. So there are those longevity doctors, okay? And they treat people. And they treat people in drugs and they repurpose drugs for this cause, right? Mm -hmm. And they're measuring things. So let's say everybody is measuring the same change in the plasma of people who are treating with the same drug. We call this N plus one, not N equal one like, like uh, Brian, but N plus one. One and another one and another one and another one. And it's not going to be the regular statistics that we have to use for study, but it's really about the statistics of luck. You know, mm. if everybody decreases or increases this marker, is it by luck, by chance, or is it not by chance? It's not the same as is it statistical or not, but is it by chance or not by chance? If it's not by chance, you know, you have something, okay? And you can look at it differently. Uh, so, so I think that's that's the thing. And, and again, I want to say Brian Johnson is really spending a lot of effort uh, and and he's, he's kind of a spokesperson and he wants to be young and I, I cannot blame him, but I, I don't think you should follow his advice, even if it's successful for him, because that's not how we make progress for everyone. Mm -hmm. 
It, it kind of reminds me of the story when Dr. Duodna, the one of the people who invented CRISPR, or discovered, invented, depending on how you want to look at it, they were looking at how sometimes when um, people with a genetic illness, when the they're when the when the sometimes it would like auto heal itself because when they were doing the RNA resequencing and in our bodies, like it would, it would do it wrong, it'd like be like mutation or something, and slowly propagate throughout the body. And so they saw that that weirdness of uh, like this this thing that was happening in humans, where they would kind of get cured of something, but it wasn't purposeful, and it was like like an N of one, like why is this happening, or an N plus one, where like they were discovering it in a weird way, but it was like trying to determine the statistics of it. And it kind of reminds me of that, like we you you can see something going on, but it, they took a lot more research after that fact before they could understand what was happening, and then they developed CRISPR off of that as well from that point on. Right, right, yeah, right. yeah, and then um, so going to the 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 tame study, um, going to uh the metformin one, um, going there's a person who wrote in and they wanted to ask you a question about it, um, basically, which is what I would ask you is uh, so this is more enemies, which I you know hopefully you don't have more enemies. The person uh, writing in, um, what is the significance of the tame trial for the broader field of getting regulatory approval for therapies that directly target aging or all cause a, uh, mortality instead of something narrow defined diseases? And then there's a second part, but I think starting there with like what's the significance of it as it relates to the larger field of aging. Um, look, life expectancy throughout human evolution was 20, 30 years. For 100,000 years of human evolution, it was 20, 30 years. Think of it. Um, and it's only in the last 150 years that uh, all of a sudden life expectancy tripled, right? It's 80 in the West world. It's it's getting down in the United States. It was 78, now it's 76. Uh, we have a lot of, of problems uh, in dealing with health healthcare in the United States, but it's quite an achievement. But what happened then is people after the age of 60 started getting diseases that were not part of human evolution. Okay. In evolution, people didn't get die from Alzheimer and cardiovascular disease and, and uh, 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 Alzheimer's. You know, those are those are the diseases that we got that were diseases of the last 150 years. And what did the government said? The government said, well, let's form the NIH, the National Institutes of Health. And the National Institute of Health will be responsible for preventing and curing those diseases. Okay. Uh, by the way, a very successful, you know, a very successful thing because obviously life expectancy and health has been increasing in, in the United States. So the government knows what to do. But we're coming and saying, just a second, remember most of what we've done to increase life expectancy had to do with uh, public health issues, right? How we dealt with the agriculture, how we cleaned the water, built sewers, did vaccination, right? It was all prevention. Um, and we're saying, okay, we got to the fact that we have diseases and we discovered that actually we can have a prevention before those diseases will start. And this is what we're trying to do. Unfortunately, those institutes who are not institutes of health, okay, they're institute of diseases. They're the National Cancer Institute, the National Diabetes Institute, the National Heart and Lung Institutes. Those institutes are saying, excuse me, we have our budget and we have our disease, so, so we're not interested in you. And the only institute that is interested is the National Institute of Aging that gets 3% of the budget for 45% of, 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 of the health cost, right? Uh, so this is kind of where we are trying to come and say, okay, we'll show you, okay, we'll show you that we can prevent not one, not two, but three diseases and mortality in one study. Mm. And what's the tool that we have? And I'm calling it a tool. It's metformin. And metformin is probably the best tool, although there's another drug that is also shown because metformin has shown all that over generations, okay? Metformin has been used in the 1920s and 50s 
to prevent um, to prevent flu, to treat arthritis, to prevent malaria. At the time, it was discovered that it lowers glucose in diabetics, so it became an anti-diabetic drug. But actually, metformin didn't start as an anti-diabetic drug, and all of a sudden, you discover it's not only an anti-diabetic drug, because it targets a lot of diseases that are, uh, are age-related diseases, diabetes being one of them. Um, and so we're, we went to the FDA, and we as a bunch of scientists, and we told them, listen, we are planning this study. We want you to hear about the study we're planning, and you, we want you to, we, we want you to tell us if, if you have any comments, because we don't want to do this study, and then you'll tell us, oh, you should have done something else. So we mm -hmm. set the, uh, the heads of many of the FDA institutes, and, and they said, you know, bring it on, and that's on, on, that's in a movie, okay? Ron Howard did a movie for National Geographic called The Age of Aging. It's a great movie about aging, by the way. You can put it as a, as a reference. It's really cool, and he's narrating that. And he's coming with us with the, to the FDA, and he gets the FDA to say, yeah, bring it on, you know? So uh, that's what we're doing. But I want to say what's special about the study and what's distracting many people. They don't get it so much. We're saying, hey, aging will cause your next disease, okay? Um, we don't know what's this disease. We're agnostic to the disease. For every disease you're going to get, you're going to take a point. You know, if your father had heart attack when he was young, you'll get heart attack, okay? If your mother was diabetic, you'll get diabetes next. But you're getting one point over time. And we're going to show that we're taking those bunches of diseases that you can get and we're just preventing them. And that's mm -hmm. what we want to show that the FDA. And if the FDA says, okay, you showed this to us, that, that will really, because a lot of the people are saying, you haven't proven, you haven't proven yet that you can do something about it. I, I really challenge that. I think we've shown it again and again. But they said, you know, a study like that haven't been proven. FDA hasn't accepted you as, you know, has accepted the study as something. So until you do that, we are not buying into that. So it's very important to do that. What is it about metformin that allows it to be repurposed in so many different ways? Again, because it targets all those hallmarks of aging. Look, mm. we have those hallmarks of aging, in order to be a hallmark of aging, you have to show that something goes wrong. And if you fix it, your animals live healthier and longer. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there's a lot of hallmarks of aging between seven and, and 12. <laughs> and I, I don't care to say them now, but uh, one of the interesting things with drugs like metformin or SGLT2 or rapamycin, that they all target most of those uh, most of those hallmarks of aging mm. so, okay so what they do they do the following they take an old cell or an old organ or an old body and they make them younger mm -hmm. and and that's why you get a lot of effects we used to argue what the drugs are doing well they're doing something black black box and then you become young and so you you say oh it did it this way or that way. No, it's doing something and then it touches all the hallmarks of aging. And that's that's how you know it's a gerotherapeutic. If mm -hmm. you take a, a statin that is an anti-cholesterol pill that is very important, okay, and will lower your cholesterol and decrease your chances for heart attacks. But if you take the statin, if you give it to animals, they're not going to live longer because they don't affect aging. They affect a specific disease. We're looking for drugs that affect the biology of aging. Hmm. Yeah, the, um, I was uh, recently listening to a person talk about uh, statins, and they were, they were saying that there was like some um, interesting research that maybe they don't do everything that they're supposed to be doing. So whenever there's someone who is taking something like metformin that has been around for a while and doing a full study on it um, to really prove it out, I think that's uh, uh, amazing. When it comes to the... The study, how much money roughly do you need to have to like just completely get it from where it is now to where you can be done with it? 
can, before the money, can I can I just make a point here? Mm -hmm. Every drug, every drug, and, and that's why the second day is that there's in medical school is not there's no always and no never. Every mm -hmm. drug has something, okay? And even though with longevity drugs, their side effect will be longevity, they also have side effects. And metformin is no difference. So let me tell you one thing. Metformin is not good for young people, okay? It's not good for young people. Metformin lowers IGF, which is a growth hormone, and young people need a lot of growth hormone. I, I don't think we should lower that. It's good, it's good to lower it in elderly, but not in young. Uh, metformin decrease uh, also um, uh, testosterone level in males, in some males, okay? Mm. There's no reason to decrease testosterone in young males. So metformin is a drug that you take with aging, or if you're young and have diabetes or PCS, you know, so there's some other indication for metformin. But I I want to I want to really because some of the people that are picking up on metformin are people for example who are exercising. If you if you want to bring if you want to build muscle, then metformin is not going to allow you because it decreases pathways that are important for muscle growth. Not not muscle age, but muscle growth. So you you don't take metformin and don't complain that it doesn't work for you. It works for elderly. Mm -hmm. All the studies, all the studies I know with metformin were done, the clinical studies were done on people over the age of 50. They were usually much over the age of 50, but over the age of 50. So I don't think metformin should be taken by young people unless there's a reason to do that. That's part of the personalized medicine, just, you know, the age. <laughs> mm -hmm. But, um, this, I think this actually answers a question that uh, one of our previous guests on the show asked, Dr. Glorioso. She she brought up that um, taking, I can just read it. Um, there are several meta-analysis showing increased Parkinson's risk and non-diabetes who with uh, metformin use and subgroup analysts showing metformin exposure increases the risk of Parkinson's disease by 66%. It sounds like it might be one of those like, um, you know, with everything good, there is a bad. Well, the, the, the problem is, um, there are tons of studies on metformin, okay? And I think the, the, so people said, well, you know, you cannot publish, you know, it, it makes a bad public, a, a bad study, a study that's contrary is harder to publish. And it's actually the opposite. If you have a contrary study, it's easier. You can say mm. thousands of Papers have shown that metformin protects from Parkinson, but we're showing you that it's not. Mo most of the studies that have been contrary recently, not not published in good journal, have not been a have not been good studies. Okay, um, and I, I, again, I don't think that metformin is the answer for diseases necessarily. I don't know if metformin in Parkinson is good drug or not good drug, the idea is you take it before you get Parkinson and not after. Mm -hmm. There's also bias. If you don't do a controlled study, you're, you're, there is a bias. Look, metformin uh, lowers mortality um, significantly, at least in diabetic people, it lowers it significantly by 30 to 40%. So think about it. If you're on metformin and you lower mortality, but 40%, you maybe have more years to end up with a disease. You have to account mm -hmm. for that. You have to account for the longevity when you look at the disease. Mm. Okay, it's it's really complex. Part, part of the problem with association studies, and look, there are 250 studies that metformin prevents cancer, but there's no single clinical study that shows that. And so I don't know what to do with this association studies. It has to mm -hmm. be clinical studies for me to know. And if it's not clinical study, I can easily find what's wrong with it, okay? Mm -hmm. I have no, no problem. But uh, is metformin good for everything? No, <laughs> okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, The uh, speaking of you as a physician, you've mentioned this several times, and I think, you're one of the few people on the show that has not only been a doctor, but you've also served in the military. 
as a doctor. Uh, I think you were, if I looked it up right, you're the chief, you were the chief medic and physician for the Israeli Defense Force, which I think, I don't know, that sounds pretty cool, at least on paper. Um, and I imagine back then they didn't, like, personalized medicine, focused medicine like that is more of a newer paradigm in, ter in terms of, like, my read history of medicine. Um, what what is the what what has that change been like is it is it new and then i'm, I'm kind of i'm going to ask you about your time then because i don't i don't normally get someone on here who's the chief of chief medic and physician for a, a defense force so that's kind of cool well, well i was i wasn't the chief physician i was mm. the, i was the chief medic and oh, okay this is this is a very uh different i'll, I'll tell you how it was helpful for me but mm -hmm. uh, but it's it's a very def, different thing because in the battlefield right and and that's where i mean you're you're a medic, so in in peace times you have things. People get flu, you know, and mm. you get Tylenol, right, and stuff like that. But but in 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 when when you're in a battlefield and you have wounded people, you have to make a decision of who are you treating and for what, okay? And there's a priority, okay? People who have a head injury, all your uh, concern is that they don't vomit and suffocate so you turn them on their side but you don't spend time with them although they're the most severely right the severely thing people who have chest injury you have to put the chest tube in in order to allow the air to go out or the blood to go out so they're kind of a priority but before you do that you have to see that there are no bleeding because bleeding is the easiest to stop and then you stabilize the person right mm -hmm. so those were the kind of decisions the personalized decision that mm -hmm. uh, that we made um, in the army and then you know when the helicopter comes and you evacuate people who do you evacuate first and who's last there's consideration there too so this is the kind of things that i was in the army look the the reason the army was important for me, okay? And and it's, look, I was in a different country. You, you see that I still don't speak the, the language, but I was three, a little bit over three years in the army. I started as nobody, right? There's a guy three months older than me that told me when to eat, when to get dressed, what to do every second of the day, right? It was your zero, just a zero. Mm -hmm. And on the third year, uh, I was I was the chief medic. I had an office. I had a secretary. I had a car. I used to do inspections with helicopters. Okay, so so it's a whole lifetime. And what happens when you have a whole lifetime in three years? You understand that things are generic. When I came to the United States, I wasn't frightened of everything. I kind of know how it works. You have to try and you have to try again and you have to find a way to do that. And and that's why it was helpful for me because I had my whole lifespan and I said, okay, I get it. You know, same people, different kind of problems, different language, but I can, mm -hmm. I can deal with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know uh, my grandfather was in the military and I know a number of people are in the military. And it seems that like the discipline, the routine of it is something that is really helpful in carrying over when you leave the military to be successful in whatever you choose to do. And it's, it sounds like that, I don't know to the extent you've kept the routine and kept the, the methodologies as you've gone forward in life, but you've definitely kept, you know, uh, how to prioritize and, and, and personalize the medicine. But do you, I actually just ask you, do you keep any of the things from the military or did you, when you, when you put on your civilian clothes, you just like, no, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do it my way from now on. Yeah, no, I think what the military allowed me to understand is, is that you can be innovative and you don't have to be shy. Look, when I was a kid and I looked at uh, Western movies, okay, mm -hmm. I was a kid 60 years ago, okay? So when I looked at Western movies, I used to see this sheriff or ranger that rode from town to town and he got to town and he just made an order there. He killed the bad people, helped the good people. <laughs> And when I came to the United States, I was kind of disappointed because it wasn't a sheriff going from town to town. It was a corporation. And in corporation, everybody has their, their in line. Everybody has discipline. So the question was, how can you become this ranger in a corporation? And I had a good idea because I was, I was kind of in a place where I could innovate and mm -hmm. I wasn't scared. I wasn't mm -hmm. scared to stay in line, basically. And I think that was helpful for me. Look, 
when when you ask this question and you you kind of suggest that I'm giving advice, I'm not. I'm you know when people are asking me for advice, I'll say, I'll tell you what I would do, mm -hmm. and take it off the table so we can talk about you <laughs> because I have a different background, I have different experience, I have I have this uh, terrible flow that I've never made met a stranger, you know. I like everyone. I want to talk to everybody. I want to collaborate with everyone. I want to be loyal to everyone. And that's very easy for me. I, mm -hmm. It's not what everybody wants to do. Mm -hmm. Well, if you ever, I don't know if the extent you're still looking for those rangers or those sheriffs uh, in America, but if you go to uh, like like Western parts of Texas and uh, Missis like the Midwest, like West of Mississippi, there are still towns just run by sheriffs and they, they do <laughs> like dispense law and stuff, but they're like, they're like 50 people in the town. I've I've driven through some of them. They're really uh, the, the good and bad with it. I don't know if, you, if the extent you're still looking, you can, you can find them. Is all I'm saying. The so one thing I'm always curious about is um when I, I've been talking about more about mental illness on the show more more and more because I think it's a really important thing. And since you had to make such hard decisions in terms of you know who to prioritize, who's who's who not to prioritize as the medic, um, did you ever have difficulties with mental illness, or did you have to do any like meditation or anything like that to help you? Because like sometimes people, when they go through stuff like that, it's hard for them to let go. Um, no. So I I haven't done. I had a very mild, a uh, few hours mm. of shell shock kind of thing in the army. <laughs> I I got over that in hours. Okay, but mm. I was I was devastated for an hour for a few hours, and so I knew that I'm kind of resilient. Mm. Uh, to that i have i have a good mood and and look uh, again social connectivity is very important part of longevity people who are dragged people who are miserable people who are in pain it's not good for their it's not it accelerates their aging so i respect that but if you're asking personally no i'm i'm a, i'm a, I, i'm kind of a, you know uh, mildly drunk that's my disposition <laughs> I, I don't get sad <laughs> hmm. that's interesting do you, do you think it's like a genetic thing like something you inherited or it's just a part of your personality i i think it's a personality trait mm. i think it's being being pre pretty much optimistic hmm. well uh, you came to the right place america's like well it used to be like the land of optimism i suppose but i don't know if it still is depending on how well, people look at things israel, israel was like that too and we're also not doing so well there so mm. well <laughs> I, I i have a friend in israel and he told me this fact which is israel has the highest uh percentage as a relation to the population of entrepreneurs anywhere in the world like Correct. most entrepreneurs come from israel like uh, it's, it's just an interesting factoid um so um going back to uh, longevity because I, I imagined you know we don't want to stray into politics so the uh i uh I see comfort, eight one six one. I don't make these things up. These are their names. Uh, I he, they're asking. I wonder about his opinion as to why the ITP trial of metformin failed to show any life extension benefit in a mouse model. Um, I imagine it's just like the mice models just are not human models. But what are your thoughts on that? Well, there there are two things. First of all, the some some animals show and some didn't show longevity. And mm. I, the major flaw is there was no dose response. Uh, they, they all were treated the same and you know you, you know when I, I i used to say when i when i started aging research uh, the model that we all use this caloric restriction right we will take animals half of them will give them to eat whatever they want and half of them got 60 percent of that and those caloric restricted animals lived 40 percent longer but they also were healthy right but you already know one thing if you give them nothing to eat, they'll die in four days, right? So mm -hmm. there's just enough. Certainly when you give a drug, if you you give it in, in a certain percentage, this is the percentage that on average extends lifespan 7%. It doesn't mean that you don't do it more. But what, what humorous for me in this argument is we know from humans that the decrease in mortality is like 40%. So I don't care about the animals. I think people don't understand metformin have shown what it's supposed to do in humans. So mm -hmm. why do I have to answer you what's wrong with the ITP? Mm -hmm. By the way, 
even the ITP, first of all, you know who, what's the animal model that lived the longest in the ITP? Mm -hmm. no. Combination of rapamycin and metformin. Mm -hmm. Okay, this combination lived the longest. Okay, um, metformin in males, you, you know, the ITP has three uh, 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 sites where they're doing, they were doing the studies. In two sites, it increased lifespan by 10%. And in one, it decreased lifespan by 2%. So it wasn't statistically different. But even mm. in the ITP, you can see that some groups have, have lived longer. <laughs> but I, I, you know, the point is, I really, I really don't care. You don't, you take one dose. And by the way, if it's 1%, they'll die soon because metformin, metformin in high dose is a, is, is like a, like a cyanide. Okay. In high dose, we, we don't get to this dose. And I don't think that we can get to act like cyanide, but it's like cyanide. So um, if animals are sensitive to metformin and they die in high dose, you have to find the right dose mm -hmm. of when it's effective in animals and nobody have succeeded in doing that, have tried to do it, not succeeded. Nobody has done it. So we don't mm -hmm. know what's the, the, we know that they give this dose. We don't care about this dose because humans have already, we did all those studies. So enough of it. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Then what of, of all the different things you're doing, uh, and you're kind of like a like a polymath in many ways where, you know, you're good at speaking to Congress, dealing with bureaucrats, bureaucrats are my bane. I, I don't know how to deal with them, but like, I get in trouble whenever I get up into a bureaucrat uh, for a variety of reasons, but the, um, but you also can do the research. You, you're a, a physician. What, what are the, is there anything in particular that you do or that you're working on right now that you're very excited or, or, or passionate about in particular? It just seems that you get to put your hand in so many different things. And I think that's stimulated in and of itself, but I don't know if there's anything in, like, anything that you're normally drawn towards or that you're drawn towards right now? So so I, I talked with you about research with hyperbaric chamber and our mm -hmm. uh, protomic as uh, biomarkers and the super agers. But I want to tell you two other things that I'm doing that are really much more uh, important now. I'm, 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 more, I'm more of a statement these days than anyone, but I'm involved in two other bodies. I'm on the executive of the Longevity Biotech Association, okay? And that's important because there are billions of dollars of investment in longevity biotech. And that, that's another reason why it's important to do TAME because, you know, we have to, uh, we, we have to allow an FDA approval for those uh, drugs. There are a lot of investors that are, have Eureka moment and they say, okay, it's quite clear to us that the next horizon is target aging. It's to people who listens to us and to smart people, this makes a lot of sense. We have proof of concept, we have mechanisms, we have really advanced technology. We obviously can do that. So people want to invest and invest early because they increase their, their, their uh, uh, chances of making tons of money with a, with a successful drug. So mm -hmm. My role in the Longevity Biotech Association is to, to take those uh, investors who come and say, okay, what's going on? So I'll tell them about the hallmarks and they'll say, which hallmarks to choose? And I'll say, tell me what you want to know and I'll get you to the right people. Mm -hmm. And I, I think, and also the Longevity Biotech Association needs another standard. We need the biomarkers to tell us after phase two trial where the trial is doing. There's lots of issues that are specific for aging, okay? Um, the even more exciting news, I'm on the council of a new society, a medicine society that's called the Healthy Longevity Medicine Society that is training longevity doctors. Look, we can maximize our health. We don't have to get sick or old to maximize our health. Maximizing our health is at every age, okay? If you take elderly and you say, hey, your phone has your health stuff. How many steps did you do? And you look at it 5,000. You know what? Why don't you do 7,000? And maybe next time we'll get it to 10,000. Mm -hmm. uh, 
what diet do you have? Do you have enough? Do you do Mediterranean diet? Do you do intermittent fasting? We can maximize your health. Sleep, do you sleep? You know, what quality of sleep do you have? Can we make you sleep longer? Social connectivity, right? We can maximize the health. And we have now a medicine society that will train people about maximizing health and also about drugs. Some of them mm. can be repurposed and some of them are there. And But you have to know what's, what's the trade-offs, what's the side effects, when do you use and, and how do you use and who do you use it with, etc. So mm -hmm. those things, what I told you is from cells to cities, okay? We're, we're all there from figuring out what's aging, having a biotech that will design a drug and treating that with a population. And mm -hmm. it, it's, it's not too early, it's too late to start doing that, but we're doing all of that. So this world for me is getting to where I hoped it would do ages ago, but that's what it takes. And, and that's why we're there. Well, um... Are you going to, in the longevity society, are you going to train people up to the point where you can have centers at different places throughout the United States? Or is it just going to be like a loose association, like there'll be like a primary care doctor uh, that have their own practices? I think, you know, how it will look in the future, it'll be really exciting. But now there are actually big centers. There's a center uh, in Singapore, Sanger center in Shanghai, center in uh, Tel Aviv, center in New York, center in the Mayo Clinic that started practicing this kind of medicine, okay? And they are our, our first uh, kind of uh, members of the organization. But what will be the future is really hard to predict because in my mind, a, a nurse and a technology is all you need, okay? Uh, you can get, look, I'm wearing two watches, okay? Mm -hmm. One is a Fitbit. So I get a lot. I get my steps and I get my sleep and, you know, other stuff. And this one is called Dido. It's not mm. out. So it's a, it's experiment, but it measures my blood glucose and my blood pressure. Okay. So, so, okay. You can download this technology and an app will tell you, Hey, did you notice, you know, you're not sleeping enough. You know, what's the matter with you? Okay. Or, uh, you load your blood test and they said, hey, your triglycerides are high and they report to the doctor and the doctor tells the nurse, put him on a drug or something like that. But I think maximizing your health and keeping you healthy might not be done by doctors, but by technology and doctor's network that will just move in if it's necessary. You don't have to have to come for a yearly visit. You'll mm -hmm. have a schedule of what to do you know, download your your stuff and we'll take care of the population. We'll see that everybody does what they need to do and we'll get an alert, okay? And, and by the way, some of this technology tells you two days before you're sick, they said, hey, you're sick, you know? Your temperature is up, your pulse is up, you're sick, okay? Think about it. And all of a sudden, two days later, you cough and, and you're, you know, and you have a cold and, uh, oh, the technology knew that I, I could have, I could have, I could have done something about it maybe before, right? Mm -hmm. I, I, actually, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, th that's the future. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, I was going to, I was going to ask you about the, if you had some technology like the one on your right hand, because I have a friend named Rob Quinn who uh, can detect sepsis 48 hours before you'd be going to the hospital for it just with a wearable technology. So I was going to ask you, um, is the one on your right hand uh, something within the association or is that just something that you guys are experimenting, like you personally experimenting with? Well, I, I think it's out in China. I was asked mm. to do, I'm also uh, measuring my glucose to compare and I'm taking my blood pressure uh -huh. just to see. Um, I'm advising, by the way, to some of those those technologies that actually need artificial intelligence to get all this information and figure out what to do it and what to tell you. Because I think it's going to be an important important part uh, uh, of, of medicine, of preventive medicine, of preventive aging. Is there any technology, like low hanging fruit almost, um, that you don't have, like the right hand one that's an experiment that you wish people were developing right now or are developing that you'd like to highlight? Oh, that's a good thing because for years I was I was saying 
a blood pressure, okay? That mm. was the thing I'm missing. So now it's there. By the way, I, I don't know if it's great. I think it shows, I like the blood pressure that it shows me, but I think it's lowering my blood pressure more than it is. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm, I compared it several times and it was closed enough, but I think it tends to do lower. Mm. Um, so, you know, the technologies will also improve. This is a laser technology. Mm. Um, uh, what else uh, do I want to measure? No, I think, uh, so I, I'll, I'll tell you, but, but, um, back to the biomarkers. Um, I, I pretended like there'll be biomarkers for aging, okay? But I'm, I'm actually talking about something more sophisticated. Uh, I have those 5,000 protein in thousands, thousands of people, and I know what what increases between the age 65 and 95, okay? Mm -hmm. I have, uh, but now we can also establish those proteins are coming from different organs and we can see from which organs they're coming because it is possible that your muscle is your strongest part and your brain is your weakest part. So those those biomarkers will allow us to see where you can get into trouble and focus on that, right? Because if you have a liver or you have a brain, it's maybe a different treatment that you have to start. Mm -hmm. But not, but you know, not all our organs are aging at the same rate. Okay. And if we can find the organs that are weak, maybe we can improve what we're doing as far as uh, as keeping them healthy. Mm -hmm. This uh, so it's a little two part. There was a, a listener who wrote in asking if smoking, alcohol, that type of stuff would accelerate specific, you know, or organs to age faster. And then um, related, can you get all this data just from saliva? No, from saliva we get there. There are things we can get from saliva, but in our case, we get it only to do whole exome sequencing of the DNA. Mm. Okay. okay, that's all we're doing. No, we 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 don't we don't do it in saliva. Yeah, then how do you get down to the organ level, like the granular level, to know if one's aging? Yeah, we need to take a blood sample from your face. Oh, vein okay. Much. Okay. Okay. Yeah, Which much is, more invasive. It's yeah. Well, not much, not much more, but uh, you know, not it's not in vain. In my in my mind, uh, look, there are a lot of people that take injections for whatever mm -hmm. reason. Uh, there's lots of people who need uh, who give blood <laughs> for good, and there's a lot of people who, uh, and most people have a blood test once a year. They should, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I, you know, I, I don't want to call it invasive. Blood drone is not invasive, but that's how you get information. Um, I just meant relative to you know saliva. Not it's like, blood drone is quite unless the, you have a bad uh, phlebotomist and they stab straight through it, which I've seen happen. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why, because the vein is very obvious to see, and it even feels different. But, um, but yeah, related to the the listener write in, does smoking and alcohol and related activities like that does that do anything in terms of like accelerating aging? Uh, well, they do. Uh, they do increase uh, age age related diseases. Okay, so uh, look, <laughs> there there are two parts of what we're trying to do. First, you have to get there, right? <laughs> you, you have. Yeah. You don't want to die, not in accidents, not from cancer, right? Not from other diseases. So we have to get there. In order to get there, you cannot smoke and, and be a, a drunk guy, right? And then we can do something about your aging. Um, alcohol has been really interesting uh, for the fact that the American Medical Association used to uh, suggest one drink a, a day for women and two for men, okay? Because there are kind of association studies that suggested that that's of benefit. There are lots more studies now that suggest that ever any alcohol is bad, okay? Any alcohol is bad. And of course, it's back to there's no always and no never in medicine, right? So yeah, some, some people alcohol is good for them and some people alcohol is bad for them, except that you don't know who. But what the American Medical Association have done is taken any recommendation about alcohol. They're just not dealing with it because it was such a fight. 
and and you can see how people say come on you know uh, you know if if you take the social interaction out of our relationship you know give me something else what do i do we go we go you know what we we do ice cream instead of alcohol you know that's not healthy either right so uh, it's kind of funny but uh, basically i agree that alcohol uh, has uh, being alcoholic is really bad alcohol just take care and don't overdo that cigarette smoking is also bad mm -hmm. is there one alcoholic drink that you tend to drink i just i'm thinking of ben franklin where he would just drink moderna madeira it's italian okay. i think yeah. yeah so well okay so for me personally and that also happened your biology changes with aging and what I've noticed, I've started noticing several years ago that if I drink for dinner, so so first of all, I told you I'm kind of a baseline, a little drunk, you know, when I drink alcohol, I become quiet and I don't like mm -hmm. myself, okay? But then when I go to sleep, alcohol is excitatory, okay? Alcohol has that, it, it takes you down and it takes you up depending on the, on the doses. And so I couldn't fall asleep. So I started not having alcohol, you know, or if I have alcohol, it's before dinner, you know, at six mm. o'clock, let some hours pass. And then I notice that red wine is the worst for me, although I love mm. red wine, I love Cabernet, it's the worst for me. But there are two drinks that I can drink and not suffer. And one is a cognac sour or brandy sour. And the second is Aperol spritz. Those are the mm. two alcohols that somehow don't seem to affect me much. Maybe because I'm, if I'm having those drinks, I'm having them relatively early. But mm. if I have wine at the same time, I'm still going to suffer. Makes sense. The, so for the Longevity Biotech Association and Longevity uh, Society, is there any help that you need? In the, so we have a lot of listeners and I always try to find, like, at the, there's, uh, TED Talk started this thing where at the end of some TED Talks, they'd have, ask people to like put everyone towards the direction. So if everyone listening could go in one direction to help you out in those associations and societies, is there something that we could do to help, um, move the needle forward? Um, so look, we, we always need uh, people who are excited, who can help us do small projects. I would suggest the following. Um, you can find on the web uh, for the Longevity Biotech Association and for the, oh, did I, did I mention the Academy? The, the, uh, mm, the, Academy, the Academy of Health and Lifespan Research, which is the top zero scientists. I'm on the board of that too. We have the same um, executive director. It's a, a Risa Starr. And I, I suggest to find her on the web if you want to be involved in any way. Uh, we'll find things for you to do. Uh, uh, I can connect it through my email or I can send you her email. Um, and uh, and, I, and I can uh, put you in touch with the medical society. The medical society is harder because the president and vice president, the president and vice president are two white women but one of them is in singapore and one of them is in shanghai so mm. i'm not i'm not sure that it's uh, that it's uh, you know ready now makes sense and then um what are some books you'd recommend people check out as you can tell i, I like to read and these aren't even all of them i have more over there but uh, what books would you recommend uh, at least i check out based on this conversation so uh, first of all i wrote a book that some people mm -hmm. like okay it's called age later and it takes you through my studies. We never talked about my centenarians or, or we didn't take, my, we talked about the super agers, but uh, what, you know, how, what was my journey for 30 years? What we discovered in a way that you'll understand, for example, you'll understand why I'm doing intermittent fasting, okay? Uh, I'm also mentioning the hyperbaric oxygen, but then I didn't have the data. I just gave it as an example of something that, you know, something is happening. We don't know why. We never thought it would happen. It came from nowhere, right? So those things are in my book. There's another book. If you're into nature, two books, mm -hmm. I would say. Um, 
One is called, it's by Steve Osted, who is a geroscientist. Uh, he's, the chair, he's the chair of the board of AFAR. And he wrote a book that's called Methuselah Zoo. It's such a fun book about nature. You learn about animal and, and their longevity, but it's all really incredible, incredible stories. And you learn so much about those animals, uh, even, even, even not through their longevity, but their longevity is really amazing uh, story and really fun to read with lots of fun, fun things. Uh, now I'm reading a book that I, I if, if you didn't ask me, I, I didn't think of it, but it's What a Plant Knows. Oh, that's a good book. Sorry, you have this book? Yeah, I, I'm, I, yes, I've read it. Yeah, so, so it's, it's like, it's really fascinating. It's, it's things that maybe I should have known, but because I haven't been doing plant for 30 years, but plants can hear and plants can taste and plants can smell and plants can move. <laughs> so uh, it's kind of fun, but then it comes together on the biology. And, you know, they basically, plants have the same amount of genes that we have uh, with some different purpose. They have, for example, a BRCA1 that is a cancer gene, but plants have that. If you take it out, they do something else than cancer, but, you know, it's kind of interesting. So all those uh, books are for lay people, intelligent lay people like your listeners, and uh, they're fun to read. So this is a, a book that I think you'd like based on the plant one. It's called Entangled Life. It's about uh, fungi and mycelium and like everything that uh, on that level of the world. It's really, really good. If you like the plant book, you're like this. I want to thank you for coming on the show. And uh, I hope everyone got something from this episode. And if you did, leave a comment and let us know. But uh, uh, Nir, thanks for coming and taking the time today. Yeah, Lowell, th thank you very much. That was great. You asked uh, some good questions. I went away, uh, you know, not not in any. You see, I wasn't uh, I, I wasn't doing the army thing. I wasn't doing one by one. I just went wherever the flow was. And I really hope that you guys uh, uh, will keep on. Uh, helping us and and spreading the gospels that uh, this is an important thing and it's very important for the world it's important for the economy we haven't talked about that it's important even if we wanted to go to mars to 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 stop aging uh, so so let's get, let's do that you know let's let's not predict about a lot let's not uh, predict the future but but create it mm -hmm.